Okay, I think we'll begin. Um, so thank you very much for coming to the second session of the Constitutional Transitions um, Colloquium. Uh, it's, my name is Sujit Chowdhury and I convene the colloquium and I direct the Center for Constitutional Transitions. And it's a great honor for me uh, to introduce uh, Professor Saeed Amir Arjaman from uh, SUNY Stony Brook, um, a very distinguished uh, sociologist uh, an expert uh, on um, Middle East constitutionalism with particular expertise uh, on Iran, but also more wide-ranging interests uh, in constitutionalism and modernity, and uh, who has been um, for many, many years uh, written very insightfully uh, on, 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 on Middle East constitutional change and, and in the wake of the Arab Spring uh, continues to produce widely read and very important work. So we're very, uh, we're very uh, delighted that he uh, is uh, with us today. Uh, the title of his paper is Revolution and Constitution Making in Iran and the Arab World. And so the format that we've, um, that we've agreed to today is that um, Professor Arjaman will open up uh, with about uh, 15 to 20 minutes of remarks. I'll, have a, I'll start with a question, uh, and then we will uh, continue the, the discussion. So please go ahead. Well, thank you very much for your uh, kind words. Um, and uh, you have... Uh, all, at least most of you, I think, have, have read the draft, yes. so you'll, you'll kind of, I don't need to uh, repeat it. I will just be uh, fairly briefly try to, to highlight it. As was pointed out, I'm kind of, my main interest is in Iran, but of course the Arab Revolution is, is, is such a very interesting phenomenon that I couldn't stay out of it. But I have to warn you, I'm not very up to date. You, some of you probably know the draft. <laughs> Published yeah. <laughs> that I have not read yet, but yeah. it, will be, yeah. it would be good. We could go uh, through. But that. we'll but ask you anyway. Certainly, I want to absolutely yeah. educate myself. That's that's very good. But but basically, the reason why, of course, this uh, Arab Revolution, not only because of its uh, obviously uh, being an exciting event, it was also very important for my uh, work um, and and and. Uh, on constitutionalism because of the connection between revolutions and constitutions, of course. Now, written constitutions are, as I have often said in, in these earlier uh, essays, it's, in fact, they are compromises among what I call heterogeneous principles of order. There are different principles of order that are espoused by signif different significant political forces at the time of their making. Now, revolutions, of course, mean the revolution means the rejection of the old regime and the construction of a new political order, and the constitutions that are made after revolutions, therefore, uh, are very significant. They represent a new kind of uh, ruling bargain, uh, and once they're finally made, of course, they set, as I argue, the parameters for routine politics for uh, decades, uh, generations to come. This doesn't, of course, mean that constitutions are over, uh, always implemented. On the contrary, they're very often uh, honored in breach. And, uh, 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 but uh, their kind of breaking, of course, impairs the legitimacy of the regime. It, uh, it, it, it gives ammunition to the opposition and so forth. Now, uh, in the paper, I argue, as you noted, that the, uh, the, this Arab revolution is very much a constitutional revolution in the uh, countries that it succeeded, um, Tunisia, Egypt, uh, and uh, Libya. Uh, now, I argue this even the, the case in, in Libya where there really isn't a tradition of rule of, law, uh, rule of law and constitutionalism. I put together in the paper what very little there is by way of constitutional developments before Gaddafi comes into power and destroys everything. But that really doesn't amount to much at all. Whereas the other countries concerned, especially Egypt and, uh, and Iran, but of course Tunisia too with its new destour or constitutional party uh, uh, leading the independence, etc., having the first constitution in the non-Western world in 1861 and so forth. These three countries are very dif different. They do have uh, an important uh, tradition of the rule of law. Uh, and, and so it's, uh, and, and then of course, Libya doesn't have that. But there's another distinction from the viewpoint of revolution that I'm interested in. Um, in Tunisia and especially in Egypt, of course, the states were not destroyed. Uh, so the, the, the pattern, they, the state survived. Uh, different components of it. In Tunisia, uh, 
the army kind of is much smaller. It quickly went over to the revolutionaries and it abolished the secret police, which is very, very significant. In Egypt, of course, that never worked. The secret police is, 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 is still there. These trials have been ineffective and the army is much stronger. It played a much uh, more drawn out uh, game. And I think what is significant and I think is, is probably missed is that in playing the, the military uh, in Egypt, in playing the game that it did play actually, the constitutional card for so long, really depended on the strength of the idea of the rule of law. And in Egypt, uh, it, it has deep historical roots. It was Nasser, as you know, tr may not try to destroy it in the 60s, uh, on the basis of Arab and nationalist ideal, Arabism and national ideology. It didn't, it did survive. Uh, and, uh, and I think, as I emphasize in the paper, I think one very important background to the Egyptian constitution making, which you don't find even in, in Tunisia to the same extent, is uh, this issue, is, is legal mobilization because of the strength of the rule of law uh, tradition. As uh, our uh, colleague in uh, Mona El Rabashi uh, points out, in fact, that's really the legal mobilization was the alternative to, to, to democratic, to political mobilization. Use of the courts, uh, the constitutional court became very powerful in the 1990s and 80s and 90s until Mubarak started appointing his own uh, people to it. But also uh, Egypt has this very important uh, administrative court, the uh, the Majlis al-Dawla, the kind of the, the court, this council of state officially, but it's really the administrative, administrative court and then a hierarchy of administrative courts, which is game, has played a very important role in this. Now, the military, I think very clear, cleverly, not only did they kind of uh, try to use the liberals against the Islamists and so forth that everyone remarked, but they used this, uh, their powers as uh, authority, as, as a provisional government to uh, issue decree laws. And I didn't come across anyone disputing those, including very important constitutional laws uh, people, the opposition, didn't say you don't have the right to do it. Uh, and now, of course, of course, President uh, Mohamed Morsi is the beneficiary of that, that now that he has become president, I think uh, he did uh, reverse those and he issued, again, presidential decrees, uh, uh, reversing the military's uh, latest constitutional coup just preceding his, uh, his election that you read about, I think, in the papers and in in, in, in my paper, uh, so I, I, I think that's, that's, that, is, that is very important. Now, as far as the, the, the point I started to make was that, in fact, uh, as, as regards revolution, this makes the Egyptian case very much a case of negotiated revolution, similar uh, to the uh, Eastern Europeans, the so-called velvet uh, and uh, or uh, color revolutions, whatever you want to call it. You remember in Poland and Czechoslovakia and uh, these uh, Hungary, these the state didn't didn't collapse. It it, it indeed it was there, and they had these roundtable negotiations. Now the pattern of negotiation in Egypt was very different, as I point out. It was kind of a syncopated between the, the kind of behind the scenes meetings and mass demonstrations in the Tahrir and then in Alexandria, other cities, etc. because that was the main uh, way that really Muslim Brotherhood, especially what the opposition could, could bring so uh, some force. But basically uh, it was a negotiated uh, revolution. And, and so that kind of, it was a negotiated revolution, which as I saw, I think uh, I tried to show the, the courts were drawn in very quickly. They're, they're drawn in by the, the scuff. They're drawn in by the presidential candidates. They're drawn in by both people who disputed the elections uh, against and for and against Muslim Brotherhood, for and against Ahmed Shafir and his, his idea, his candidacy, and, and so forth. 
and 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 so the, so this Egypt is, I think, the ideal case of a kind of a, a constitutional politics of a of a negotiated revolution in which uh, you do have a, the, the state survives and you have a strong tradition uh, of um, uh, of uh, of rule of law. And now. Uh, the Iran case I brought in because of Islam, of course, and I think the different, uh, very different constitutional place of Islam in the 1979 uh, constitution of Iran and in the, uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the constitutions in the making in the, in the Arab world, what, what it's likely uh, to be. Uh, now, I think the Iranian case, I think, is, is, uh, is quite unique in that it was at the height of Islamic ideology, which actually was stronger outside of Iran, but it was very quickly taken over by the Khomeini and then the, uh, his, his followers. Uh, the idea that is, the constitution was an ideological constitution, the revolution was based on Islamic ideology, as it says it's in preamble, and the whole, whole constitution uh, should be based on Islam, uh, Islamic law. So this notion of a ideological uh, the Sharia serving as a basis of a totally consistent ideology that is embodied in constitution was, was very uh, unique, very, uh, very unusual. I mean, it was uh, in, uh, advocated by others, but, but mostly in the forms of slogans of Islamic government, etc. It wasn't thought out. But the actual, the first versions of the Islamic uh, Iranian uh, constitution published, the, there was an appendix, the old Quran verses and the Hadith and so forth that were supposed to back every, all the important, in, important issues. Now, this is what's changed basically with the Arab, and that was very unusual because as the point I make here and elsewhere, by the way, is that this, this Sharia, there is an incredible amount of unnecessary fuss made about the Sharia with this notion of the Islamic State. The Egyptian law, Iranian law were fully consistent except for the Hudud punishments with the Sharia. And if you look at the Iranian civil codes, as I think in the, the paper that, that you mentioned, uh, it, it does give the option, even under the Shah, even monarchy, to use the Sharia. It's not, I mean, nobody used it. But it said, of course, if you want to use the, uh, the Hudud, etc., you can. And of course, in Egyptian one, it's not quite the case. It, it's, it's a residual category, but so it is in the Islamic Republic of Iran. It, despite its being Islamic Republic, actually, they always say that if, the, if, you, if there is a statutory law, you shouldn't go to the Sharia, you shouldn't use fiqh. So, the, so I think the fuss uh, over this is really a, is, is, is a red herring and, and, of course, a very powerful one. And I think the, the, there is a realization of that among the Muslim, with the Muslim brothers and others. What they do want, they remain Islamic, they remain very attached to Islam, and as far as we, we know from all the surveys, they also want the implementation of the Sharia, including the Hudud and the, the, the punishments for adultery and, and, and theft and, and, and all of that. There's this very strong support for that. But what's changed completely is that nobody says that the Constitution should be based on the, on the Islamic law, on the Sharia. They say that the Sharia should be a limitation to legislation, especially to the kinds of law that, that we have. I think this contrast I make here and elsewhere is very important. We can get back to it during the discussion, probably. Uh, the, if you take Islam as the basis of government, you obviously are going to have a non-democratic system. It's not compatible with democracy, this and that. But if you say that the Sharia should be the, a limitation to legislation and government. And incidentally, that was the position taken in Iran in 1906 with its first constitution, where a committee of five mujtahids were supposed to approve all the laws as not being contradictory. In Pakistan, the so-called repugnancy clause of that no laws should be repugnant to Islam, Islamic law and so on, comes into it. So, so this is basically the, uh, my 15 minutes <laughs> uh, introduction. And the, the link, I think, so, so the basis of, uh, of these comparisons is whether the strength of the uh, 
uh, the rule of law, and one thing that I, is in the book that I don't mention, the, also the strength and survival of the state, and this here I discuss Gaddafi's very peculiar kind of uh, system that really couldn't, has been often described as state destruction. So that makes the, uh, the, the Libyan case a non-negotiated uh, revolution in the sense its constitutional politics are much weaker, and its kind of issues of leadership, militia control, etc., are stronger. So my pers uh, prediction was quite pessimistic that it would go through this revolutionary circle, as I think we've seen with, with the militias not not uh, not not uh, retreating or, or not being uh, able, uh, wanting to give up their turfs. So I think that Libya is in kind of a marginal case from our point of view, but these. Uh, three other, uh, I think, uh, countries clearly are, 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 are very important for their constitutional politics, their constitution making, uh, and of course, um, Iran, you could of course go on into the post-1979 uh, discussion, but that would be, that would be uh, something different. I think we have enough things okay, on good. the table for these. Terrific. So let me open up with a question by trying to push apart Tunisia and Egypt a bit more than you do. So, so you basically draw this distinction in the paper between what you call negotiated revolutions, invoking the idea of the pacted constitution that came out of Eastern Central Europe. And you say that that's Tunisia and Egypt, and then you, just, you distinguish between that kind of case and what you call the revolutionary power struggle in Libya. And, and I'm wondering if, um, in fact, so let, to begin with, that Egypt and Tunisia are actually quite dissimilar, and what's been striking is their dissimilarity to the point where it's not correct to say that they, that they, they themselves embody um, you know, two examples of, what, of negotiated constitutional transition, but rather they're two different models of negotiation. So in, in, the, in the Egyptian case, you have the remnants of the state, the SCAF, uh, the, the security police, um, the judiciary, um, and uh, basically negotiating with different democratic elements, right? And so there's two levels at which the negotiation is taking place between the old regime elements and newly democratically empowered um, political actors. And then among newly democratically empowered political actors as well, there's a, there's a process of negotiation as well. So that fits your model, I think, <coughs> more than Tunisia, where what, what's, what's striking about Tunisia is that there has been, in a sense, a displacement, more at least from our, from my perspective, more of a displacement of old institutions, right? So you have the disbanding of the old uh, of the old parliament, the um, the constitution of an interim parliament um, that then passes an electoral law and also adopts a framework for the constitutional process, an election that's free and fair, uh, the election of a parliament that does double duty as a constitutional assembly, and there's been continuity institutionally. Uh, in Tunisia, not the kind of battles and scuffles that you see between the military and the courts and, and parliament. I mean, right now in Egypt, we don't have a parliament. It's not clear when we're going to have elections. We have a constituent assembly whose legality is being challenged before the administrative court. You have a supreme constitutional court that's staffed by Mubarak appointees. You have a SCAF that has reached some type of arrangement with the Brotherhood, the terms of which we don't know what they are. That seems very different from, 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 from Egypt. So I'm just wondering whether it's 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 useful to think of those as two examples of the same type of process or very sort of two different types of negotiated transitions? I think the latter. I think there's definitely two very, the two contrasting types of negotiated uh, settlements, negotiated patterns of, uh, and of course the Eastern European one would be yet a third one or a mm. fourth one, you mm. could have more than one. South African one was clearly be, be yet another case of, uh, Negotiate. So, so uh, I think the point's well taken. It's absolutely uh, correct that there are two very different modes of negotiation in that uh, the, the Tunisian one kind of is less of a negotiated thing, if you like, because the surviving state is weaker, the displacements, as you point out, and so forth, especially the secret police is gone. The army was always a more of a professional army and, and smaller and never... Uh, I don't think it has the kind of economic empire that the Egyptian mm. army has and so forth. Uh, so I think these structural factors are important for accounting for the different patterns of negotiated uh, settlement. Uh, the Tunisian one, of course, 
follows more of a classic, as you pointed out, there's a parlor, there's a constituent assembly. That's, mm. that's usually the, the, the French model of the, mm. after French Revolution, there's a, there's a constituent assembly to make the, uh, make the constitution. In Egypt, there was none. Uh, Egypt is, uh, I mean, <laughs> there is this assembly of hundreds and so forth, but, yeah. but it, it wasn't really an elected constituent, constituent assembly at all. It, it's supposed to be a draft, uh, draft making, uh, making a committee, basically. Um, the, uh, so I think if, if you want to kind of have structural factors to explain uh, these differences, these would be it. Right. In addition, I think the difference can be explained in terms of the significant actors. I think the Tunisian case represents a very successful attempt at coalition building right. that the Egyptian one does not. Um, this kind of tripartite uh, agreement that was, I think, written into their administrative law of December 10th 2011 it was really a kind of a very crafted sort of negotiation among these uh, three uh, groups in the parliament, with the NASA being the, the predominant uh, party. And but the other two, instead of excluding them as the Muslim Brothers uh, did in Egypt with their constituents, uh, the, the drafting assembly, uh, it was uh, they tried to come into an agreement with the division of the, basically the three offices, the kind of the speaker of the house went to the smallest party, the president of the republic went to the middle party, and of course the, the prime minister, which has the executive main executive power, went to the uh, Islamists, the NASA. Now, uh, and as part of that, I think, again, the very significant thing that you don't have in Egypt is that uh, then the Islamists were forced, the NASA were forced to accept the, uh, the so-called Article 1 of the Constitution mm -hmm. that says, uh, that doesn't mention the Sharia at all. Okay. So let's begin the queue. So um, who would like to go next? Yeah. I was wondering, I mean, you, you, you came up with the concept of negotiated revolution. Now, if one can see revolution as tabula rasa, <laughs> an oxymoron. Now, there's a view that the Constitution is a result of a trauma, collective trauma. Now, if it's a negotiated revolution, is that enough of a collective trauma to really inform a new Constitution? That would be my first point. My second point is uh, about dynamics, uh, constitutions as imports. Because what you see in those countries, and in many other countries, when those things happen, you have the involvement of a lot of external actors. Uh, you even have actually people that come down and draft constitutions in some countries. Now, I, I view, I'm not, I'm not an expert in those issues, but I view what's going on there in the, let's say, uh, debate between the Sharia law and more, you know, secular law. Uh, it's, it, it seems to me that it's, an issue of fair and challenge, how we should organize ourselves. Now, with this involvement of external actors that come with constraints, uh, namely human rights, for example. So now, do you think that those countries can really come up with constitutions that reflect uh, truly internal dynamics and that can provide for a specific organization of the society based on their own specific internal dynamics. And my last point, uh, on Sharia as an interpretive framework for, for legislation, uh, if we, as we know what interpret, interpretive uh, framework is, is there really a difference if it's only as a framework for interpretation rather as substantive law? Okay, so there's a lot of questions there. What I think might be helpful is if I collect a couple more questions, and then we'll uh, turn it back over to say um, to, to respond. So is, are there any other questions from the floor? Yes, I, I have <coughs> a remark and a question. Uh, the, the first 
point de regard has to do with the first point which was asked and to what you were saying at the beginning, speaking of constitution and revolution. It seems to me that, at least in the European experience, the only one I know, constitution has been always an attempt, as the French said at the end of the 18th century, to put an end to the revolution. Constitution is an attempt to create a political order after a disruption. Now, <clears throat> evidently, the disruption may be limited or radical. We may want to distinguish between regime change or something like profound economic, social, cultural break, which was the case in France at the end of the 18th century, the case in Russia after the First World War, the case in China after World War II. So, but I mean, it, it, uh, it's, and it seems to me that if the disruption is really profound, deep, it will take a long time to stabilize. You know that in America there is the joke that in France you cannot buy a constitution because it's a periodical publication. They changed 15 times. But that's not because they are intellectually inconsistent, but because the, the disruption was so profound that it took at least one century to find a stable order that the constitution can <coughs> uh, regulate surviving. That's, that's the remark, I mean, and I think that has something to do with the differences between different countries in the uh, Middle East. But my question, which is more important, is about something I don't know, so I want to have your opinion. It seems to us, people who are incompetent, and you touched upon this point, that in the Middle East, religious legal tradition is much more powerful than in Europe, which was for century a Christian world, where religion and religious culture in the entire Middle East was the only form of culture. No one could read and write for century in Europe, which was not a member of the Christian church. Still, for some reasons in Europe, the, the weight of the, uh, the religious legal culture reduced its role, at least because three facts. The rediscovery of the Roman law in the 13th century, the role of the academia, the legal academia in universities like Bologna and Padua and Paris, and third, the development of legal profession in England in the age of courts. So th these elements produce a huge <coughs> amount of secular, quasi-secular legal culture. So um, what happened in a country deeply uh, rich in culture and civilization like Persia or the Arabic country, they, they were at least as cultivated as Europe if not more in the Middle Ages. Knowing perfectly well Greek culture, translating and commenting Aristotle when we were unable to read Greek. What, what, why, if it's true, there is a weakness of secular legal tradition and a more important religious legal tradition? If this is true, by the way, if it's true, what we believe that the, the legal uh, religious tradition is so powerful. You you said something interesting that it's considered in some kind as a limit, not as the basis. Can, can you tell us a bit more since you know that story that I don't know what's the reason of the difference in the role of secular legal culture in these two areas of the world where in both parts they started with a very strong religious culture. It's not that Europe was not religious, it was uh, that fully religious for a very long time. Okay, so you want to 
to get into the story. Yeah, there are quite a few things. Yeah, yeah. So so, me, yeah. Okay, let me do. Uh, now, what are the first question, uh, the putting the two together? Are constitutions answers to trauma or are they attempts to end revolutions? Uh, I, I don't think they're either, actually. Uh, they would be kind of attempts to realize the revolution, to translate revolution into reality. Um, I'm not sure about the trauma part of it. The trauma applies certainly to uh, to countries with very gross, uh, you know, human rights violations, things of that sort. That, uh, and then uh, I think that would bring in the issue of human rights, which was your second point, that, but you assumed that that would come out from external observers. But, uh, but that would be kind of the, the sort of, uh, it, it, I don't think it applies to all countries that they have a trauma. They just want to, usually they're very jubilant at the time of the revolution. They got rid of the thing and revolution is a big festival and they want to create a new, new order. They want to translate revolution into, into reality, and that's where they, that's where actually the unity that was the unity on the, that resulted in opposition of the old regime and its overthrow. Uh, they're traumatic to to some extent, but none of these revolutions we talked about is is, is violent, except uh, with the possible exception of Libya in. Iran was not so violent even despite the uh, casualty uh, uh, numbers claimed that were later on very radically revised down to a few thousand and this certainly Egypt is a thousand or so but 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 uh, by uh, there is nothing like the you know the Russian revolution or anything like that in terms of violence so I'm not sure about the um, the either either of those uh, things. Now the revolution as kind of a constitution as a way of realizing revolution then leads us to this question of whether or not it's limited change or, or total change. Now this is the this is a big difference there. I think that the Iran in 1979 at the height of the Islamic ideology, the first Islamic revolution, the idea was that there's got to be total change. And therefore, the constitution had to be based on Islam. So they gave all these Sharia kind of things as an appendix to, to justify it. Uh, in the Arab re revolution, is the, the thing is much more limited. It's kind of having uh, freedom, uh, democracy, getting rid of dictatorship, cronyism, corruption, uh, the police state. Now, that's a much more limited thing, and that's where Islam doesn't take this kind of, the, the form of the basis of a totally new ideology, but rather, as uh, indeed uh, the Iranians in these reform movements since 2009 and since 1990 onwards said, that they, they said ideology was the greatest misconception in the Iranian case, and that's where, where I think we can, the discussion of, Islam uh, in the Arab world, I think, can learn a lot from the example of Iran and how the Iranians themselves changed it. I think the biggest regret was that, in fact, they thought that the, the revolution could be, the, the, that constitution could be based on Islam. Montazeri, who was the successor designate of, of, uh, of Khomeini, Khomeini, changed his mind. A lot of other Ayatollahs changed their mind. And of course, all these reformers said that, you know, that's a, Political system is a rational thing. It's not based on the tradition at all, yeah. and and uh, Islamic law began as one uh, Iranian uh, very good reformist, this cleric Moshtahed Shabazzari pointed out. It didn't begin with uh, it wasn't foundational. Muhammad didn't write any constitution of anything, despite the so-called constitution of Medina that have analyzed. But uh, in fact. He just wait for people to go and ask specific questions to him, and that was his jurisprudence on the basis of analogy. You start with a specific thing. So if you want to follow that, you'd say, well, this is democracy, is this form of government, monarchy is another one. You would ask an Islamic jurist that question, which of those is better? And if you put it that way, instead of 
what, how do you, how do you found the, the, the Constitution on the basis of the Sharia? Nobody in al Assar says that you should do that. Uh, but if you ask them, well, is, uh, is this uh, Constitution compatible with principles of the Sharia, then the answer is different. And here it's significant, as I mentioned, that this new term that's, that got gained currency both in Tunisia and Egypt, this uh, civic state, whatever the Dolomadania, that was a coined by the Al Azhar people on the basis of this new approach. They said, as you rightly point out, the religious, the pattern of secularism doesn't fit Islam at all. What we do, but there are differences between religion and politics. There's the vision of labor between religion and the state, the religious institutions and the state, and so forth. And therefore, what we want is that the, 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 a civic government, they don't want to call it secular, but they want to call it civic. I mean, that's a very clever move uh, that, uh, again, the clerics have made that, that discovery. It kind of has this uh, uh, connotation of the philosophy. You mentioned Al-Farabi, the virtuous city, etc. It's kind of the same word, Medina and Madania. Uh, and, and it kind of tries to draw on that, uh, that uh, I mean, subtly, uh, uh, heritage, which brings me to this idea of the strength of religion. Yes, I think Islam clearly, that's a big difference uh, at the time at least of modern constitutions. Uh, and that's why the Iranians were quite inventive in 1906. That was the first. The Ottomans didn't really have a, uh, or the Tunisians in 19th century didn't really have a discussion of that issue at all because those were not, those were granted constitutions by the monarch and, and not result of democrat, mass mobilization as the Iranian was. But with the Iranian ones, I think that was issue, that, that, that basically is, is uh, you know, Sharia as a limitation to government. I mean, you, you still may not like it and you, would, you could argue that some of the provisions of the Sharia never limited anything at all, such as the, uh, the, uh, the legal, um, legal provisions for a long time. They were not part of public law. In public law, you're supposed to, in Iran, Ottoman Empire, there's, there's so-called four crimes against, the, uh, uh, against public order that were actually uh, punishable by, the, by government, by the monarch. So you couldn't kill anybody without the monarch's uh, a specific order, robbery, uh, theft, in fact, theft of, of, of caravans and so forth, the governor was supposed to restitute it. That, 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 the jurists never, uh, in, uh, in most, in the, the mainstream countries, I mean, there, there are certainly movements like the Caliphate, etc., when the people wanted to implement the Sharia, but, but there was a clear distinction between uh, what you call the secular legal culture and uh, what I call public law, it's uh, the, the ethics of political ethics, I call it really, the manuals of government, statecraft, uh, what the ruler should do, rule should be based on justice and so forth. That was really quite separate by, uh, from the Sharia and, uh, and uh, the proof that I give elsewhere is that these great jurists, Al-Ghazali, Al-Mawardi, etc., when they wanted to address public law, they would write a advice to the princes, the or, or uh, the Nasihat al-Muluk, etc. Each one of them has a book of, of that kind that addresses the political ethics, and it's just not part of the Sharia. That the Siyasa Sharia so forth is it was a very marginal case. Uh, but uh, in Islamic history, that's why I think it's instructive to look at actually the, uh, the, uh, uh, the earlier reconciliations of the Sharia and Islamic law by Muhammad Abdu in Egypt, uh, Sanhuri of course, and by these Iranians that are much less known in the 1930s. They were mullahs. They knew the Sharia law very well. They, they, the issue was not secularization, but codification, basically, for the Ottomans too in 1857. Now, this brings me to the whether or not human rights is external. I think we say that Islam is the internal one. When you say that each of these countries should develop a constitution that suits its own needs, 
uh, other than religion and Islam, it's uh, hard to, it's not hard, of course, each one. There's a question of federalism, there's a question of the ethnic balance, ethnic the population composition, things of that sort. Uh, but those, I don't think, uh, require uh, new models. The, the, the one big thing that you attribute to external actors but, uh, uh, is, of course, human, human rights. Um, now, it, I don't know what, what external means. The, there's always been an, in a global political culture, uh, there's been... Uh, give and take, and if you think about the evolution of the human rights regime, the contribution of the non-Western countries has been very great. These truth and re reconciliation commissions coming from Argentina, coming from South Africa, these were from the periphery. They did not come uh, from, uh, from, the, uh, from the center. They're not a Western imposition, of course, the declaration in 48 was, but, but, but since then, especially recent developments, they were more like answers to, to internal trauma. You would say you need much greater protection of human rights. And then, of course, what happens is not so much external factors, but these, uh, these uh, human rights activists, which, which really try to internalize that, this kind of recursive cos cosmopolitanism or whatever you want to do, this interaction of global and local one. So I'm not sure that solving the problems of one country is incompatible with, say, importing human rights or something like that. Uh, but, but, it's, uh, but the uh, question of interpretation versus uh, legislation, I think that's, again, a very good example of Islam in Egypt. Of course, the, uh, the Iranians, uh, didn't do much interpretation at all. This Constitution Council of Guardians became very quickly a gatekeeper. Its political function of pro, uh, protecting the regime totally eclipsed its jurisprudence, constitutional jurisprudence. They didn't give reasons for anything. They just kept rejecting uh, candidates and so forth. Uh, whereas Egypt, in fact, there is a, const is a constitutional jurisprudence of the Supreme Constitutional Court of Egypt on Islam, which is very quite significant. It kind of addresses a lot of these issues, and I think it will be very helpful ultimately in, uh, in dealing with the placement of Islam in the new constitution when it, when, it, when, it, when it does emerge. It will kind of be a statist solution. It wouldn't but, uh, but uh, so I think these were a whole range of uh, questions. I don't know why I think if I haven't covered any of them, they'll come back. I'm sure that, well, I think, <laughs> so I'm just keeping a cue now. So Gianluca, would you like to jump in? Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Thank you, Saeed, for your presentation in the paper. I want to somehow follow up on uh, Sujit's point, and that is uh, on the negotiated revolutions. Uh, besides differences, uh, I wonder how you think that the use of negotiated revolutions help us understand the constitutional transitions. That is, when we are in a setting in which even identifying what the negotiating parties are and what the terms of the agreements are, um, I wonder what use we can make of your uh, concept of negotiated yeah. trans, uh, revolutions for the transitions themselves. The second point, and here I'm taking you uh, uh, more into your comfort zone of Iran and the legal professions. Uh, so the dominant um, reconstruction that we hear that is fundamentally based on the Ottoman experience is that there is this conflict between the traditional clerical elites and the new emerging legal professions. Now, in a previous work of yours, you have sketched how that actually took place in Iran, which is quite distinct from what happened elsewhere in the Ottoman, uh, in the Ottoman provinces. Now, I so the reading of the constitutional arrangement in Iran is somehow based on some sort of um, religious justification, jurisprudential uh, uniqueness of uh, Shi theory on power. I wonder if that is the case, of, of, or rather we should look at how this dynamic between the traditional 
clerical elite and the modern legal professions played out uh, in Iran? Two questions. Um, I haven't actually thought about your first question, so I don't want to rush to answer it. Uh, I don't know. I'll think about it. Uh, I use the negotiated revolution to deal with the kind of revolution we had, not so much the kind of constitution making that, that comes out of it. I, I suspect that it, it's less revealing about that because then these, these other things like the, you know, the tradition of rule of law, rule of constitutional court, again, Tunisia doesn't have a really uh, significant constitutional court at all, although the, the, uh, the, the kind of the, the leading jurist is the, is the son of the Grand Mufti of Bourbiba and, and, and the member actually of this very insignificant constitutional court of Tunisia. So, so, but, uh, so I would, uh, but I, I think it's, it's true, just calling it, you cannot, not only calling something institution, a negotiated revolution doesn't give you, tell you much about the mode of revolution, right. that's true, that could vary, but it also doesn't give you much directly on the mode of constitution making. It's, I, I think, other factors will have to come in. It, it, it has some significance in that, but, but again, in, in the case of, uh, uh, you know, the, the Egypt, the negotiations uh, are really not about the content of the constitution at all. It's about putting pressure on the government to, by, by going out into the Tahrir and so forth, or demonstrating in Alexandria and so forth. Uh, that, that pattern didn't a, you know, the nitty-gritty of writing the draft, etc., was done in both cases, in, inside the assemblies, drafting rooms, or behind the scenes, and so forth. Um, so, yes, I think there the tradition of the, the rule of law and, and actually the, the, the composition, obviously, of the drafting, the constituent assembly or drafting assembly, etc., have to be brought in uh, as, the polit as do the political factors. Uh, on the Iran-Egypt contrast, uh, more so than Iran-Tunisia, that's a little more distant, but Iran-Egypt, as you pointed out, Nathan Brown and I have a book coming out on, on comparing the constitutional politics and the uh, rule of law in Egypt and, uh, and Iran. And uh, there, as you rightly point out from this other uh, article of mine, I think, one big difference is the relation between the legal profession and the ulama, the, the Islamic jurists and the legal professions. That's quite different in Iran and quite unique. Uh, the legal profession is much stronger in, uh, in Egypt, it was weaker in Iran, and the Islamic jurists didn't, were, were weaker in Egypt and much, much stronger in Iran. Because of Shiism, that's, that's again is, is, is a big difference between Shiite and Sunni uh, Islam. In Shiism, of course, I, I think the system of government, the right of the jurist to rule, El Ayat Fari, that was not conceivable in, uh, in Sunni Islam. It's only a result of the transformation of Shiite clericalism by Khomeini. It, it wasn't. Tradition, Shiite tradition, they didn't have that, but, but certainly it was possible for him to construct a, a, a theory of theocratic government as the rule of these religious jurists, which is not possible to do uh, in, in Egypt, okay. in the Sunni world. Um, I want to ask about uh, one particular issue that I find very interesting, which is the question of family law, and bringing in this question of religious clericalism versus uh, legal professionals. Uh, you mentioned that, and I know in the Arab world there used to be a double system of, of specialized Muslim courts, uh, family courts and civil courts, and that was abolished. That same thing happened in Iran much later, if I'm correct? Uh, earlier, were, actually. Hmm? Earlier, Early. earlier, in All the right. 30s. In the 30s. And in so, Egypt, the 55 was uh, the... And so I was wondering how that process took place and whether uh, bringing, especially family law, which has a very, uh, the religious implications for marriage and divorce are very uh, important, how bring that 
those questions into civil courts from uniquely clerical courts uh, impacted uh, rights, and especially in connecting it also to constitutional questions. Right now in Egypt, one of the clauses uh, that's hotly debated is a clause on, on women's rights, and, and in the draft that's been circulated online and publicly, it says that you know, women will have equal rights subject to uh, Islamic Sharia. And so I was wondering what bringing family law into civil courts did to the way family law looks like, and whether, uh, as a matter of, of civil rights, there's still more to be done for women's rights in, uh, in family law. Yeah, well, but that's actually very interesting uh, I issue the the um, uh, the uh, you know the the tradition there are two things the uh, uh, one was the issue of codification so when they codified the family laws actually they, it was based on the sharia either the shiite or the sunni version of it the uh, you know, the Egyptians said the Sanhuri had a little more of a leeway because there are different schools and you could took, uh, choose from, etc. But basically, there, there wasn't any, any, any major change until the Shah's family law way down in the 1960s and Mubarak, the Susan, uh, well, this, who, whose law is the whole I think the, 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 the Jahan's, yeah. Jahan Sadat's law etc but uh, until those changes basically the, the, the Sharia law applied now but the difference was who would actually have jurisdiction the religious courts I don't know about Egypt Iran is quite interesting they were uh, kind of they never never abolished they didn't do that they did this in a very sneaky way of course they kind of First of all, they codified the family law, and then secondly, they gradually took the jurisdiction of the religious courts uh, away from them, make that they said any Mojtahed who wants to have a court has to be a, a government employee, and no, none of them wanted to, to do so, so they kind of went out. Then they would have a, for a while, they would have a religious advisor to secular courts uh, to, in case of family and other, uh, other laws. But then that went completely uh, out. By, by the 30s, uh, those religious courts disappeared without being actually abolished. Uh, uh, but, the, uh, but the substance of the Shiite uh, family law was written into, was codified, basically. Now, the interesting change is the post-revolutionary thing, which is really uh, kind of the opposite of what you think, because these revolutionary courts, of course, needed women and women judges that and you couldn't be a judge according to the Sharia. Uh, so what, but, but in fact, the judges are women, but, but the, the, the verdict is countersigned by a, by a male in a fairly bureaucratic way now, and they do the, the actual work, and then and somebody else automatically adds the signature, and, and so that goes. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the Maslahat Council in Iran made very major changes again in family law despite their Islamic thing. They introduced alimony uh, on the basis of the argument that, uh, you know, reproduction and whatever sexual functions were a duty, but, but domestic labor was not the duty of the wife. So if you, if you, if you, fire, if you divorce her after 30 years, you should pay for 30 years of domestic labor. But anyway, so that would be kind of a, uh, an, uh, an introduction of alimony, which didn't exist in, in Islamic law. Um, so basically, I have a question which relates to the highest courts and constitutional courts. Um, from the reading, also from your speech, uh, I'm a little bit curious to hear how you think that these courts play a role. So um, you mentioned that many of these constitutional courts in the region have been very powerful and they help in the democratization process. Uh, and I think the best example is the Egyptian Supreme Constitutional Court, which has you know, given down a lot of cases and very controversial cases and upheld certain values. So if you kind of go back to Iran, uh, Iran is a different case. We have the Supreme Leader and the, the Guardian Council. So just from a more comparative aspect, which body and which institution kind of plays 
let's say, the role of the Egyptian Supreme Constitutional uh, Court in upholding certain constitutional values and human rights, for example. Do you think we can compare those two bodies, or...? Um, no, uh, you can't. Uh, as I said, I think the, uh, the, the, there are a few things. The Guardian Council was originally set up as a sort of a constitutional court, at least uh, on the French model of pre before it was reformed. That was the, the 58 French constitution was the, the, the model for that. So, and and uh, that wasn't a constitutional court in which any uh, ordinary citizens or groups had any standing. It was basically the laws that had to be approved by, and that was like the French Conseil Constitution before the 70s when they added human rights to their jurisdiction. Um, but, uh, but nevertheless, it was intended as a, as a kind of a, a constitutional uh, court. Uh, and at the beginning, they gave reasons. I think that was quite important. There was kind of a legal rationale of it for, for the first few years. The, um, the, its, its secretary, or, or chief justice, you would call the secretary, was Ayatollah Safi, who was a very good traditionalist jurist, and he always insisted on giving reasons for, uh, for saying why this law is against Islam and so forth. Uh, but then, uh, after him, then he resigned. He had a big clash with Khomeini in 1988, when Khomeini said there's this absolute mandate of the jurist, and if the jurist says that you should not pray and you should not go to Hajj, you should obey him because he is the ruler on behalf of the hidden imam. And this, uh, so he said, I'm sorry, I can't go along with that. This is uh, not, you cannot say you can't pray and you cannot go to Mecca. Uh, that's not, you. but so he resigned and he went out. Uh, and then, but after him, then the Council of Guardian became more and more politicized. Basically, it became the gate gatekeeper. It, it, it had this function again. It goes back to the French 58 constitution says that it should supervise the elections. Now, the Council, Guardian Council interpreted that, and in 1990, they, they passed a, an important interpretation in their favor, saying that uh, supervision means primarily deciding who is, who, uh, choice of candidates and disqualification of the candidates. And then, so of course, then that got to the point where they would, uh, they would kind of uh, reject thousands of candidates, including some many incumbent members of parliament when they didn't like them and so forth, without getting reasons. Again, no reason given. And, and that function basically dwarfed it. It's, it's not incidentally, it's, it's, it's part of the, to my mind, it's, it's a result of a, the, an ideological constitution rather than an Islamic one. Uh, the Turkish constitutional court actually is is quite similar. The, the human rights is not their, their main uh, jurisdiction or, or concern. They're much more concerned with where until recently, I don't know the changes, but, but certainly was the, their main concern was to protect the ideological foundations of the Kemalist regime, secularism. Uh, the same way as the Guardian Council in Iran, its main council function is not protection of human rights at all. And, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 rather, it's protection of the regime and its, its ideological foundations. And, uh, um, so I think that's a big difference. The, uh, the Egyptian Constitution, Supreme Constitutional Court, which was really the Supreme Court before 1970, it's kind of, they added constitutional jurisdiction and title and so forth to it. Uh, well, that kind of evolved partly accidentally, but certainly it was evolved through international influences of the, the, the kind of... But it, it, it really happened before constitutional courts became fashionable. It's, it's in the late 70s, so it was an internal mm -hmm. development to some extent. But of course, once they were there, they could insinuate some international human rights things into their jurisdiction and so forth. So the answer is, of course, the Egyptian 
constitutional court is much more important as a legal, as, as, a, as a constitutional organ than the, well, the foot Guardian foot Council. Now in the context of the transition question, right, as to what the role of, the, of that court is, right, given that it's been, right, it's, it's yes. uh, right, so. Well, we. We don't, right, strike dissolving the parliament and uh, upholding, the, you know, Shafiq's candidacy. And, right. Right, so. Right, That's right. So, right. Well, there was, as yeah. Nathan Brown said, that really yeah. was their constitutional coup just before right. the elections. Yeah. That the, yeah. that has been undone by uh, by Morsi. But you're the Egypt expert. Yeah. When is he going <laughs> to change the uh, the the chairman of the constitutional <laughs> court? He's got he's going to get around to it. The he, he, yeah, he got. So, so, well, look, I, 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 we actually have some more questions. So why, we'll come back to Egypt. Um, but Lissandra? Yeah. So my question was related to the previous question. And I am I am by no means an expert on Iran, but your paper inspired me to do a little bit more reading on it. And I was wondering how um, the Iran's Expediency Discernment Council, how that plays into it, and if maybe that could be compared to the oh, yes. Egyptian Constitutional Court. From, from my reading of it, it seems like its role is sort of to oversee both the, constitu the cons Consultative yeah. Assembly and the Guardian Council. Yeah. And kind of like try to balance state interests with with the Islamic law. So how does that actually play out? And That's a very interesting question. Um, yeah, it. I could have given you a more interesting answer if if the process hadn't been disrupted by the uh, June post June two thousand and nine Green Movement and the electoral fraud. Uh, up until that point, uh, what you say, the Council, Maslahat Council or Expediency Council was uh, a body that whose importance was constantly growing and it was filling some of the gaps that things that the Guardian Council couldn't do. It was created by Khomeini in 19... Uh, 1988, and then it was written into the con amended constitution in 1989, the year just shortly after his death. Now, the reason why he set it up was that there was this constitutional crisis, and then the, the, the important laws were blocked by Council of Guardian as being against Islam, against the Sharia. And so Khomeini, and that's the point where he, he proposed the absolute mandate of the jurist, that the jurist as the ruler of the country can use maslahat or expediency to overrule the letter of the Sharia, the provisions of the Sharia. That, of course, was a very Sunni, by the way, <laughs> concept. The Shiites officially rejected it. So for the first 10 years, people uh, had a very hard time, like Raps and Gurney, they had to uh, to use the Zarura or the uh, uh, dire urgency, like Al Ghazali said, that if you don't have meat, uh, you don't have food, and you're going to die, you can eat carrion, even though though it's 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 usually haram and forbidden. But but you so they would use that. Uh, what's the term? The uh, the necessity, yes, kind of dire necessity, the kind of, is that really, um, no, there's a better term, but legal term, but I, I, I guess, Rukhsa. right, Rukhsa. that's the Arabic one, yeah, but, but the, the <coughs> English the term, but anyway, it was a kind of very narrow basis for it, that it's, it's, it's a matter of life and death of the, uh, the regime or, to, or, or a person to do it. But now, and they rejected Masla because that gave, gave the, the government too much leeway for Shiites. But now Khomeini accepted that and even set up a, uh, an expediency council. Uh, now, that, its power was growing, and it actually had a very special position. It wasn't, it didn't, ha well, it, it could both interpret the, the law, and some major cases were put forward as interpretation of the constitutional law. Allowing women judges to countersign, for instance, was one of them. This Alamo, uh, the uh, and, and and several other uh, interpretations very important. But more than interpretations, it actually 
passed the law. It was a very curious system. It, was, it had been set up in a fairly haphazard way. Uh, but uh, there was no provision for their amendment of the laws to go back either to the parliament or to the guardian council. Of course, the jurists of the guardian council were also members of that. So in other words, but instead of the six of them deter deciding everything, there would be six among, among 18 members who would in, in that mass law council. Uh, it made some very significant moves. It, it, uh, it helped Ahmadinejad, the president was against privatization and so forth. And it kind of in 2004, five, uh, the, um, uh, according to the constitution, the expediency council is supposed to determine the major policies of the, of the state. Uh, and it was strengthened against Khatami when he was a reformist president from 1997 to 2009. 2005, later on against Ahmadinejad too, when he became a little unruly, not at the beginning. But, uh, so they would, uh, they would, there would be a, a case of a law passed by the parliament, say, majlis and rejected by guardian council. It would go up there. They could do anything they liked. Uh, they, they would, they like. They would add a few clauses to it. They would change things, or they would. They didn't necessarily have to choose either the side of guardian council or the majlis. They could add things to it, and then that would become law, and it would not go back <laughs> to either parliament for ratification or to the Guardian Council. A and they did make some significant changes, including the alimony that I mentioned earlier in, in this way, in the, in the laws on the basis of expediency as opposed to <clears throat> overruling the letter of the Sharia on that basis. Uh, the last one was the privatization thing. The, the, there was a major uh, uh, reinterpretation of Article 44 of the Constitution. Uh, at the beginning, of course, the kind of the leftists were quite strong uh, in, uh, in 1979. Uh, they kind of pushed for these uh, local councils, but they also pushed for the cooperative sector of the economy. So according to 44, Iran has a, a cooperative sector, a public sector, and, and the private sector of the economy. And then they totally reinterpreted that to make it totally meaningless because the cooperative sector had not got anywhere. It was a total flop. Uh, the, uh, everything was public sector by then. And they wanted to privatize, and they said, no, it doesn't mean that uh, that public sector is more important than private sector. Private sector could be the growth. And, and then the Ayatollah, the supreme leader, interpreted the, that as meaning that 80% of the uh, public assets of the, 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 the public sector should be privatized. Now, the way it was done is another matter, basically. What happened was that these revolutionary guards started creating these companies and so-called privatization meant that they would just go and bid for contracts and now they have 40-45% of the Iranian economy competing with the foundations and so forth. But that was the unintended consequences, but that was the Iranian way of privatizing. But that's your question. Now, the point is that that was the last major uh, thing they did. Um, after that, Hashemi Rafsanjani lost the elections and uh, fell out with Ahmadinejad. I mean, Khamenei, I think, mistakenly or for whatever reason, backed the electoral fraud Ahmadinejad. Uh, Rafsanjani became persona non grata, and he lost his job as the head of the assembly of experts who would choose the leader. And he lost. He didn't lose his job as the head, of chairman of the Maslahat Expediency Council, but Nothing was referred to it, because basically, if you don't refer a matter to it, it can't do anything. And the leader would refer things to it while the going was good and while they wanted to curb the power of the president and set the policy. Now that Rafsanjani is, uh, is out, so is that council. That's kind of one of the ways that you know, personal politics affect institution building in, uh, in, those, in the Middle East. Daniel. Yeah. I I was surprised at one point in your paper, you, when you're discussing the, the difference between Islamic law as a limit and Islamic law as a basis for the Constitution, you mentioned that 
at least in the context of the Arab revolutions, the era of Islamic ideology had passed. And I was surprised by that because I actually, I thought the exact opposite, that it, this is, we're witnessing a, an era of a resurgence of, of Islam, especially with a lot of, take e Egypt for example. I think one of the disputes that's currently dividing the Constituent Assembly is the degree to which Islam will serve as a basis for the new constitution. So how, I guess my question is, how could you say so confidently that the era of Islamic ideology has passed, particularly with Egypt? Uh, well, I hadn't heard that. I, I think the, the main arguments I'd heard was actually the uh, Article 2 argument that the Sharia is the source of legislation. Um, uh, now, you could interpret that uh, as, uh, as I guess, ideologically that, 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 that the, the, the state should be based on the Sharia, uh, but uh, nobody's, is, that's certainly not the jurisprudence of the Supreme Const Egyptian Constitutional Court. It may be a, some Salafist uh, position. Uh, the reason why I think the age of ideology is, 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 is <laughs> well, I don't know, I'm, I'm, conf I'm fairly confident <coughs> because it's, uh, uh, it, as I said, it's very different from the manifestation of religiosity or even its political manifestation. It's, it's a mode of thinking about, about a constitution. Uh, he, I mean, the term Salafi is changed very completely. I cannot claim any, any, um, any authority on this except that the, the days that I was in Cairo, I just went to Al-Azhar and, uh, and just sat around with the, in, in a little uh, class. There were two, one given by an Azhar cleric and one given by the people whom I called Salafis, etc. Those were very kind of strict, uh, traditional uh, Muslim religious guys, but they didn't strike me as, as, as political animals at all. It, 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 there was kind of a, it, it was a non, so that's my way of thinking that the non-ideological approach uh, predominates. Now, of course, Morsi did say that Islam is the solution during the um, elections, but, but he hasn't done so since then. We don't know, of course, he could, he could change his mind, uh, but I, I, I I doubt it, I mean, because uh, don't forget the Muslim brothers for a long time were called American Islam by, by the Salafis and, and others. They are sort of reform, modernist uh, Muslims, and they have said time and again since the big uh, generational transition, what, 2005, etc., that they, they believe in changing things democratically. Uh, but changing things democratically and saying that the Constitution should be based on Islam, Islamic law, I think, are two different positions. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Okay. So can I jump in there? So, so let me just press the point a bit harder, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, so you could, you could, you're absolutely right to say that if the idea of, so you draw this distinction between Islam as a basis for constitutional order and Islam as a limit on legislative sovereignty. Right, and there's, mm -hmm. and the Iranian example, the Iranian Constitution of seventy nine is, is an example of the former, mm -hmm. and the, the kind of the repugnancy clauses or the Sharia clauses, or whatever you want to, however you want to turn them, are an example of the latter. Right. But there's another, and so and so the fact that there's not a call for um, creating constitutional orders in the Sunni world that are kind of analogous to the 1979 Iranian constitution means that the idea of Islam as a basis for political order doesn't exist. That's the, that's the essence of the argument. But couldn't it be the case that, the, the, that really the, argu the argument might be this, that there's no need to, to, to actually make that, that kind of an argument, that if you're calling for majoritarian politics with majority government and a strong executive, then the, essentially the, the there's not the need 
right, to ground a, a constitutional order in a theory, in, in, a, in an Islamic constitutional theory. That, that what matters more, right? So it's, it's about power, right? Mm -hmm. And so these, so, and so the, so there's less of a concern, like in the context where the Brotherhood and Brotherhood allied parties are capturing pluralities or majorities um, in Egypt and Tunisia. Uh, it, maybe it's not necessary for them to propose a, a constitutional agenda that is a kind of a facsimile or an analogy of Iran to nonetheless pursue that type of broader political agenda. So that's the argument in its strongest form, right? Mm -hmm. So, so what, how would you react to that argument? Well, I, I, I think uh, I, I think that's uh, that is possible. Uh, my argument basically is that you know the age of ideology in the Middle East uh, had a dynamic of its own. You began with the, the, the Arabist ideology, socialist ideology, but of course the Islamic one proved to be much more powerful. Uh, it was a, the assumption that the, you know the third, uh, like the third force thing, and uh, by the way, the idea of having a constitution based on Islam is not Shiite. It's, it's it begins as a Sunni thing. It begins with Maududi basically in uh, in the subcontinent. It, it, the Sayyid Qutb had the kind of revolutionizes it and says that well. You have an Islamic state that implements the Sharia, whatever that means, implementing the Sharia and so forth. Uh, but that's at the level of the slogan. So, so the, 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 the Islamic ideology was by no means, in fact, it came to, to Shiite Islam quite late. But it, once it came, then it became, a, it, had, it took this clericalist form that is unique of this, the rule of the jurist, religious jurist. Uh, but, the basis, I think, it, it, I'm talking about a different approach to constitution making. No, you're absolutely right. It, it, it may not be necessary. Uh, indeed, uh, I think you could argue the, the political scientist's argument for kind of the inverse relation between integration of some form, political integration and extremism and then ideological orientation. Uh, could hold very well because if, if there are other ways of gaining power, uh, why you don't need that basically? If you're excluded from uh, politics, you can't mobilize publicly, uh, uh, openly. Uh, you are not included in the regime, etc. Then you become revolutionary and you want to change this, and then you you come up with a rad radical ideology, a rejectionist one, but. Uh, I think the you know the idea of I'm, I'm saying that age is past because the notion of ideology itself is not sexy. For one thing, you don't hear it much. It's not supported since internationally since 1939. It was when there was the first wall, second wall, and third wall. Then of course a lot of Muslim intellectuals who were totally excluded from power under these dictatorial regimes said this is the solution. Uh, they were the communists. That's the, the the solution for the third world was that they had a totalitarian ideology. We need to have that. That's very much the early Maududi, Maududi's argument. Of course, for him it was fascism as well as communism that in the interwar were vigorous, uh, important ideologies for mobilizing people. So constitution really followed uh, from that. Uh, but I, I think I, I take more, more contemporary thing. I, you just don't hear that much. I mean, the Iranians, uh, and the Lebanese translated them very quickly with Sarush and others. They said, Islam's richer than ideology. You're impoverishing it by calling it an ideology. It's a world religion. It's about salvation. It's not about the political system is a petty part of it. It's you're demeaning, you're de degrading uh, Islam by calling it an ideology. Uh, others would still call Islam as the solution, but, but it's much more vague. And the idea of the but the idea of the Islamic State and the, you know, the Sharia, these have great, I think, emotional power still. I, as I said, I don't, I think I quoted a couple of uh, surveys where they actually see very wide popular support because uh, 
you know, because this is something that hasn't been done. So you know, cut, cut, cut out a few heads, and then, then nobody will, will, nobody will steal anything. Uh, stone a couple of adulteresses and adulterers, and then, then the, and all the problems will be solved. I mean, there, there is this. Uh, uh, there's a very old sociological book by Ranulf in the '30s, who actually said this extra punitiveness as a. He he put the Nazis and the. Puritans and the Protestants in the same same group that that uh, that they kind of they have to punish others because it's so terrible to be guilty yourself. I think I mean, those kind of social psychological things I think are much better for explaining this phenomenon than constitutional development because the constitutional thing is really constrained by by the notion of what a constitution is by the model by the design etc. They just have, are not thinking about the ideological design. That's my reason for optimism. Yeah. Uh, I think in part my question has already been answered just now, but uh, what an important takeaway from uh, your paper to me was understanding the past institutions uh, is very important, even particularly in negotiated uh, transitions where there's not a complete takeaway. So uh, in such a scenario, how do we ensure that an ideological revolution is intended as a complete Mm -hmm. uh, I think constitutional design is is really very important. Uh, uh, it's absolutely it's better not to have too many consultants, though. <laughs> I think Pasquale and uh, I didn't we do something for Afghanistan? Yeah. Well, uh, actually, let let me tell that story. That's that's. I mean, it's it's. I'll come back to your question, but but uh, with the Afghanistan, that's a very interesting thing. We we kind of uh, uh, were asked to kind of advise the Constitutional Commission. That if, if I remember, you were there. We never met together with it because it's on different aspects of the Constitution. But I was asked to do well two things. One of was the Constitutional Court, and one was Islam. And uh, for Islam, I made some of these arguments and said that you should. Uh, uh, really um, uh, learn from specifically Islamic ex Islamic countries and, and how these things have worked in practice and historically that, that certain things were never done. Uh, aspects of the Sharia, they're kind of interpreted the way, or I mean you have the four witnesses and the rule and things of that sort that make it obviously in, in the adultery rules in and uh, practical. But uh, but uh, my thing was uh, the Constitutional Court, of course, was Kim Shevel and they, I heard later on cars, I said that, uh, well, I can't find 12 judges for my Supreme Court. He wants me to find 12 more for the Constitutional Court. You find the judges first and then we'll have that. And then I think the, 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 as a result, the, the, rather disastrously, they said any, any, any regular court can, can, can <laughs> rule on constitutionality of the laws. But the Islam was, was more interesting, of course. The Afghans were lucky they had this old constitution actually put that thing very nicely, the repugnancy clause. It said that no laws should be contrary to the, uh, to the Islamic to Islamic principles. First of all, Islamic principles is better than Islamic commandments or Islamic Sharia, Islamic uh, of the rules of the Sharia. He said, no, it should be contradictory to Islamic principles or the values embodied in this constitution. And I said, well, this is very good. Just add human rights too, then there are three, but then you need the constitutional court to reconcile these three. And that would be a very nice, neat solution. Of course, they didn't do the, add the human right, but, but they kind of kept the other two in. And I was very pleased. And the draft was published. It was passed, etc. And then uh, the uh, and then lawyer Jerga approved it, etc. But then I saw the official uh, draft, and it had put commandments of Islam, which means the Sharia. And so I asked my friends. Actually, I couldn't get the answer until I met Lakhtar Brahimi, who was there at the time. The, I said, "Well, how did it happen? I didn't. The, they didn't change that." Uh, in the lawyer Jerga constitution, he said, of course not. They did it 
in the printing house on the last day before publishing it. So nobody knows how many things have actually been changed from these little changes like this. And, uh, but now that's not quite the answer to your question. But um, <laughs> yeah. I thought I'd. I would share that, but, but if you want to well, well, rephrase there, it, well, we'll there was come one, back. Well, there was, there, was one question, there was one point that just came out that was very arresting, which you said that, that listen, I, I only barely have enough judges for one APEX court, but not enough for two. And, and, and I want to link that comment you made to something you said in the paper about the fate of the legal profession in Iran mm -hmm. after 1979. And so what was very interesting for me is, that how you, is this, that you said that even though Nasser in Egypt um, declared war on the judges, uh, the legal profession survived. And as you know, there's a, there's a large and organized uh, legal profession uh, in Egypt. Um, and in the context of, of economic liberalization, that profession and the legal system took on a particular type of role, right? To, under, to kind of provide the legal framework for a market, for a market economy. But, there, but, but, the, but the comparison you draw is with Iran, where there is no legal profession per se, because it was, a, it was it was, um, it was oppressed and wiped out after 1979, or something along those lines. It was clericalized. And so I'm wondering what the significance of that comparison is for transitional contexts, right? So is, it, is the argument then that the existence of some type of a legal profession uh, is a sociological precondition for the establishment of some type of system of, of, of constitutional review, right? By, that, that is without a profession, um, kind of habituated into the norms of advocacy and legal argument um, that is sufficiently kind of independent from the state. It might have a clientelistic relationship with it, right. but, it's, but it's nonetheless not of the state, right? Is that a precondition for, um, for a successful transition? And if that's true, right, then let's kind of run that argument through the North Africa, right? So, so Egypt, yes. Question uh, Tunisia, don't Libya definitely not, right? Mm -hmm. And so is is that going to be kind of a, a determining factor as to the success of these of these constitutional revolutions? So that's the question. I think the my answer would be yes. I think it is a determining factor, a significant factor, not the only one, needless to say. Okay. But I think it it's it it is a, a significant factor. Um, the, yeah, I think Max Weber said something to the effect that, in fact, this is a modern legal profession is a kind of a precondition for the rule of law, if I'm not mistaken, something along those lines. Um, uh, now, what kind of rule of law, again, you have is, is, is uh, there could be variations. Um, I mean, the, uh, well, uh, Let's say, I think, I would say really two, two factors, I think. I wouldn't minimize the kind of the, globe, the, the impact of the global legal culture. I mm. think that's, that's one, uh, one factor. But the second factor is the one that you mentioned, certainly the strength of the legal profession in, in, in these countries. Um, if, if you think of Iran really the, uh, the the lawyers uh, were much weaker and they're weaker both by the Shah as I said but uh, they were destroyed completely destroyed by the Islamic government they have taken over the bar association kind of uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the the status of the uh, uh, lawyers cannot be lower than it is now there are lots of these kind of uh, uh, people without degrees who go there and kind of uh, brokers of sorts that that, that you know, are in the law association, as I said, their elections are strictly controlled. And I think uh, at the beginning, they were kind of treated as, as traitors. And they, you don't need, uh, now that you have these Islamic jurists, uh, you don't need them. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, of course, there's current shortage of uh, of, of judges, so uh, clerical judges have much, are much more in demand, and the number is much smaller, and their education is takes longer. So, there's a there's a dire need for for secular judges in Iran, but they're not organized. Secular judges are really government employees, and they don't have any organization. 
the Lawyers Bar Association was the one independent one that has been really neutralized and destroyed by the Islamic regime. And that's the sharpest, in sharpest contrast to, to Egypt. Now, the, the, the Egyptian lawyers, I mean, it's not just privatization, the strength of the profession. Uh, this uh, book that I, uh, we have in press, uh, mm -hmm. uh, there is an interesting article by uh, Mustafa Kamal as uh, where on the ideology of the, 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 uh, the, the attitudes of the judges, especially on human rights. And he shows that the Egyptian judges are really quite conservative. It's not, uh, they are not, uh, you would think that they're, they're not that all that liberal, both regarding, certainly with minorities and, and so forth, the Baha'is, right? they're fairly quite illiberal. Um, so the, yeah, the, the rule of law can, I mean, we know the rule of law can be very, very conservative as well. It's, it's not a, it's different from, but, Mm. Various mm. elements, but mm. but mm. but I think, mm. but but they, they, mm. I, I I would say that that's a neglect. The, the strength of the, the legal profession is 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 a is a key factor. Um, in addition to international, mm. uh, following international patterns and international innovations such as constitutional courts or human rights commissions of various sorts and so forth. Um, I'm going to do Christine and Pasquale, and then one more, and then we will. So we'll, let's take all these questions, and then Saeed can kind of address them all. So, Christine? I have two questions, uh, not to beat a dead horse, but to build off of Daniel's point. Could you speak up, please, sir? Oh, sorry. Uh, not to beat a dead horse, but to build on Daniel's point to tell a slightly different story than Professor Chaudhuri was telling. Um, it seems to me that, you know, just reading the news, and I, I'm not really deep into this, but um, you, there has been this discussion of having. Al Azhar have a, a really serious role in, in the Egyptian judiciary, and Article 36, which is this controversial one about women's equality, you know, kind of seemingly uh, unnecessarily restates this limitation of, you know, the Sharia on on equality, on top of Article 2, which would presumably already establish that limitation. So, I I, I guess yes, I think you know obviously the narrative is different in Egypt than it was in Iran, but. At least, and again, I'm not an expert on Iran, but my understanding of, of the 79 revolution was, in many ways, it was a secular revolution that was co-opted by Islamists. And, you know, <laughs> you can tell us that obviously a lot better than I can. But, I mean, I guess my question is, is it just possible that what's happening is a little sneakier, but not necessarily any different in terms of at least some sector of the Egyptian population, whether it's just the Salafis or the Brotherhood is part of that. Uh, so that's, that's my first question. And then my second question is, um, you might not want to answer this because it's just a tiny point in your paper, but you mentioned that um, in, in Libya that the, I'm part of the political parties uh, group with our clinic. So I was interested <coughs> when you talked about how you thought that the fact that Libya's uh, legislature preserved many seats for independence, that you thought that that was the product of a lot of international advisors having learned from the Iraqi experience um, and, and to be cautious of kind of having a one-party rule. And I find that interesting, and I, I'd be curious to know whether you think that that's the appropriate lesson to apply to Libya, because obviously Iraq and Egypt and Tunisia had this kind of one-party problem, whereas in Libya we've talked about there really not being much of a party system, and at least the perspective we've been coming from is that you know having political parties is a good thing and maybe something we want to nurture. So was that the correct move for Libya? And Again, I know that's not really kind of overall what you're talking about. Excellent. Okay, so let's collect a couple more questions, and then Saeed can um, take us to um, the time. So, yes? Yeah, just uh, a quick note in a sense to what uh, uh, Sujit was saying. Uh, it seems to me that not only the existence of a good legal profession is a precondition of uh, constitutional democracy, but also the existence of regular competitive elections. Mm. I don't have the time here to develop the point, but just think of it. Think of the case of China. China is now a country where there is a booming of legal professions, mm. largely because of economic reasons, the, 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 the globalization. But I mean, the, the, there is a law school opening each three weeks. Is the best place to get a job. 
if you want to take slow. You can take even in English. So there, but but since there is no com there are no competitive election for the foreseeable future, you don't see any interest in, in China to put uh, uh, in place a, a constitutional court. So I, I think that competitive elections are the order precondition for uh, because if without competitive election you may have a constitutional court but the constitutional court may protect an authoritarian regime mm -hmm. the status quo <laughs> what happened at some point I don't know exactly if I'm correct but in Turkey uh, you, you had a very early constitutional court it's not an epitome of a liberal institution so that, that's just a mm -hmm. It seems to me that there is a broader, more general uh, debate, doctrinal debate in, in Islam as to what is the role of Islam in the society, what should be the proper balance between Islam and personal autonomy and freedom and so on, the role of Islam in the state. Now, do you think there's a temptation by cosmopolitan elites in some countries to settle the debate through constitutional design? Mm. And if, if that's the case, is that possible? And I'd like to quickly to go back to a point made as to the resurgence of uh, uh, you know, Islam, Sharia. In, uh, of course, your presentation is uh, you know, based on what's going on in the Middle East. But if we go further in other countries in Africa, uh, where we really see an emergence of you know, uh, Sharia law and positioning. Now, and when we see that, do you think that the issue, if resolved in the Middle East, would resolve the whole issue in the whole cultural mm. and religious sphere of influence of Islam? Very interesting. Okay, we have about five minutes. So five minutes. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so actually, there are a lot of <coughs> yeah. interesting questions. So. Uh, the, the 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 one uh, question on. Uh, women's uh, equality and women, and the, it's rela related to the strength of the Sharia, etc. Uh, yeah, I mean, the demise of the ideology may be called comfort for, <laughs> for women and for many other issues. I, I think uh, if, if they say that we should stone adulteresses and, uh, and so forth, that, that's worse than having an ideological constitution, I think, as far as... I'm concerned, certainly as far as women are concerned. So I didn't mean to imply, uh, as I think the last question very uh, pointed out to it, you have Nigeria, you have Africa, etc. You have these cases without any uh, discussion. The Sharia law itself can create enormous problems it's in the, without having any, anything to do with the Constitution. If, 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 somebody, if, if these states declare the Sharia law as, as their law enforce it. So I, I didn't mean to imply, I mean, the optimism, it wasn't that probably as optimistic as it's implied, because I just want to have a change. It's an improvement, let's say, but, uh, but it's not a solution to everything. Uh, your second question on electoral law was actually very interesting, because I mean, the constitutional law is often, and that's related to, of course, competitive regular elections, are the, the point that you're making. Those are very important, and so are the growth of the parties, etc. The um, the Libyans have the worst possible uh, voting system: the single, non-transferable vote. Very few countries have them. I think Afghanistan, unfortunately, <laughs> adopted that too. But in addition to that, as you rightly noted, uh, they, they, they reserve 120 seats for the non-parties. So that makes really growth of political parties absolutely impossible. In in Libya for the future. Uh, as to the reason why, I thought the Iraqi case, uh, again, this was really United Nations foreign advisors, erred in the opposite direction of, of, of having total proportional representation. And that gave enormous advantage to the Dawa, all these clandestine organized groups as to non-organized ones. But the Libya is the opposite, uh, opposite case, and I assumed uh, that there was constitutional learning. Actually, I've since revised that uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, because I think I talked to one of the, about, heard the, one of the advisors, and 
apparently uh, the, the, it was more more um, current fear of Islamic Islamists winning. They said if uh, the, the, that accounts for that more than learning from the mistakes in, of Iraq and then repeat doing making the opposite mistake. So that was a I was a little kind of too theoretical in there. I think the actual thing was Islamic, the, the worry of the, the stopping from the Islamists to win as they had won in Egypt and, uh, and uh, did so well in Tunisia. So that, that actually ruling would make it very, very unlikely. I mean, it's possible that these individuals will little by little, one by one, declare themselves as Islamic sympathizers, but the actual party did very badly. Uh, now, now the one, uh, the, the last point is a is a, a very important one. Um, yes, I mean Islam is a is a big problem. Islam in uh, politics. Um, uh, the, actually, the, the it, it's really not surprising. There's a very old uh, sociologist of modernization, Donald Eugene Smith, in the '60s, who said. Well, in the, the most parts of the world, religion is uh, is a common uh, in public phenomenon. Uh, politics is not. As you <laughs> begin to have democracy or political modernization, you've got to, the, the religion will inevitably come into it. It's it's uh, it's naive to think that you can people give give people. Uh, the right to vote and then try to to ignore what what their preferences are and what's the strong strongest things in, 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 in for them in their lives um, so I think Islam is kind of a multifaceted uh, problem of democratization the, the relation between Islam and democratization uh, and of course my professional bias is to say that constitutional design is not only a good way, the only way we have to to deal with the problem uh, through social engineering, it's kind of because that way you tame it or at least make it consistent. You don't ignore it, but you kind of make it consistent with, you know, rule of law, uh, due process, this and that and this and that. And then, and by doing this, I think you channel it in, 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 in ways that are compatible with constitutional politics better than others. I think that's critically important, and that's the one section of constitutional design where we have to be innovative, because it's not part of the European design constitution. It's neither the German constitutional court or anyone else has a recipe for that. It, I think that's something that could be, in that sense, this is, yes, it came to your last, last, last comment. Yes, the Middle East, as they're in the process of making the constitution, could potentially make uh, may, may contribute, may make a model that will be applicable to other countries. Whether or not it's happening, uh, yeah, I, I'm very skeptical. But if, if you hired me, I think uh, then it would happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, on that note, please let's thank Professor Arjuman.